we'd like to thank SRNT for this opportunity to share some of our work on the effects of cigarette smoke and SARS-CoV-2 infection. I'd like to thank SRNT for this opportunity to share some of our work on the effects of cigarette smoke and SARS-CoV-2 infection. This is our disclosure slide. The lungs are complex and vital organs and the SARS-CoV-2 virus can infect anywhere along the, the respiratory tract. The respiratory tract starts actually at the nose and mouth, which is the upper airways and extends down through the cartilaginous airways, which consist of the trachea and the bronchi, and then through the bronchioles to these distal alveolar structures, which are the grape-like structures with a very large surface area across which gas exchange occurs. Now, each of these parts of the airways is highly specialized and has different functions. And I'm gonna focus mostly, mostly on the upper parts of the airways, which are lined by a mucociliary epithelium. This mucociliary epithelium is really important as a host defense because what it does is to use mucus that is made by the epithelium to trap viruses, bacteria, pollution, and any of the particles that we breathe in that could be harmful to us. And then there are specialized cells which have these hair-like projections which are known as cilia. And all of these cilia, these multiple cilia, beat unilaterally to move this mucus up and out of the body. And this is illustrated by this movie here, where you can see this unilateral beating of the cilia to move this particle um, of um, dirt up and out of the body. And so the way that this mucociliary epithelium works is that it has a number of different cell types to achieve its function. There are these basal cells that are located in the base of the pseudostratified epithelium. And these are considered the stem or progenitor cells of the mucociliary epithelium in that they're capable of self-renewing and dividing to make more of themselves, as well as differentiating to these specialized cells of the epithelium, which includes these goblet cells, which produce the mucus and these club cells, which make serous secretions, uh, which have a whole lot of antimicrobials, which are added to the mucus. And one of the advances that we've made in the field um, within the last decade or so is the ability to grow um, these highly specialized um, mucociliary epithelium in culture. And this is through a system which we call the air liquid interface system. And essentially uh, what this is, is that we take primary human bronchial epithelial cells um, and we lay them onto a transwell. And this transwell contains a porous membrane, and, but the pores are very, very tiny, so the cells can't crawl through. And then we collagen coat the transwell and then put the stem cells, these are these human bronchial epithelial cells or airway basal stem cells, onto the collagen coated transwell. And we have media on the top, on the apical surface, and on the bottom in the basal surface. And what happens is that these cells divide and they eventually form a very nice monolayer along this transwell. And at that point, uh, we can remove the media from the top surface of the transwell and just leave the cells growing in the basal media. And when we do that, we provide an air liquid interface. And this gives the cues um, to these stem cells uh, to go on and differentiate into these goblet cells, these mucus cells, and the ciliated cells. And in that way, we can recapitulate the mucociliary epithelium in the dish. And this is an example of what it looks like uh, when you do immunostaining and take a bird's eye view down over the top. Um, in green is acetylated tubulin, which marks the ciliated cells. And you can see um, that they almost form like a carpet um, from uh, all of these uh, tiny little cilia um, that are so closely packed together. We use MUC5AC as a staining, um, as an immunostain to identify the mucus producing cells and keratin-5 is a marker that we use to identify the basal stem cells. And these cultures are actually quite difficult um, to grow um, and are highly specialized. And I have this wonderful team in my lab, Arunima Purkayastha, Chandani Sen, and Abdo Dara, um, who are amazing students who figured out how to grow these cultures, um, which has been absolutely critical um, for performing our experiments. So now that we have these culture systems, what we can do is we can go ahead 
and um, we can um, expose them uh, to different environmental um, exposures. Uh, we can change the conditions however we like. And so um, we thought that it would be really interesting to examine the effects of cigarette smoke on SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is because there's been a lot of controversy in the literature about whether cigarette smoking really um, could give patients more severe infection or not. Um, it's been quite clear that if you have underlying respiratory illness, then the infection is likely to be more severe. Um, but the smoking connection uh, wasn't um, directly made. And this is probably because many medical centers were completely overwhelmed. And so it's possible that good smoking histories weren't taken on patients. And so uh, many years ago, even before the pandemic, we had developed a way of exposing these air liquid interface cultures um, to cigarette smoke. And what we do is we have this air type tight box and we can put the plate inside, which has got these little air liquid interface cultures. And then we seal up the box and there is um, tubing for the inlet and tubing for the outlet. And um, we're able to hook up a research grade cigarette uh, to the inlet tubing and then we can light the cigarette and we use a vacuum pump to draw the cigarette smoke into the chamber and onto uh, over the surface of the air liquid interface cultures. And then we have another uh, system of tubing. Uh, and so when we, um, uh, so we can expose the, um, the cultures to as much cigarette smoke for as long as we like. And then when we're done, we basically um, will extract that cigarette smoke again using the vacuum pump and allow regular room air um, into the system. And so essentially um, what, we, what, we, what we're able to do is to give enough cigarette smoke to injure the cells, but not enough to kill the cells. And we've worked out the exact conditions, as I said, over, over the last couple of years. And so for this particular experiment to examine um, how cigarette smoke directly interferes with SARS-CoV-2 exposure, uh, we seed the cells on day zero onto the transwells. And five days later, when the stem cells have divided and formed a very nice monolayer, we take the cultures to the air liquid interface. And then 19 days later, we start exposing them to cigarette smoke. And this is just once a day for three minutes a day. And then when we're done with the cigarette smoking, uh, we give them a day of rest and then they are infected um, by Vaitya Ramagaswamy um, in the BSL-3 facility here at UCLA. And he uses a low MOI of about 0.1 of the virus. And then we allow um, the cultures to stay with the infection for three days. And then we deactivate the virus either with methanol or with 4% um, paraformaldehyde. And then at that point, we're allowed to take the samples out of the BSL-3 to perform our downstream analyses. And so this is um, what the, the cultures look like. Um, and so here again is that bird's eye view. Here we've immunostained for the SARS-CoV-2 virus with looking at spike protein. And in blue is DAPI, which is the nuclei. And you can see in the setting of no cigarette smoke with the virus, we do get some infected cells. They tend to occur in patches. And it's usually a pretty low dose, um, a, a low percentage of cells that are infective or infected, although it does vary from um, person to person. Um, and so it's usually somewhere in the one to 5% range. And what we saw, and this is on every single culture that we've done um, from multiple different donors, now more than five different donors, um, so different five different biological replicates and in multiple technical replicates, is that when you first expose the cells to cigarette smoke and then the virus, we see many more infected cells. We see larger patches of infected cells and we see more, more of these patches. And this is quantified here uh, on the right in this graph. We're also able to assess the viral load by PCR. And what we found is that at day two after infection, we always saw a higher viral load. Again, here are two different biological replicates. We always saw a higher, higher viral load um, in the cultures that had first been exposed to cigarette smoke. Um, but at day three, many of the cells are dying and are um, leaving the cultures or um, there, there is some variability that's introduced into the system. And so we see a difference at day three after infection. And then we assessed the different cell types in the airway under these conditions. So this is the control setting with no cigarette smoke and no virus. And you can see that there's a large number of ciliated cells um, as shown here in white. Uh, when we expose the cultures to cigarette smoke without the virus, we see patches 
um, where there is a lot of loss of ciliated cells, but other areas that look normal. And when we do the statistics, there's, we didn't find a significant difference um, in the number of ciliated cells. Um, so that was um, not any significant difference. Um, same thing with the virus and no cigarette smoke, really no difference in the number of ciliated cells. And again, when we have cigarette smoke and virus, um, there's no significant difference in the number of ciliated cells. And this is shown here and quantified here in the graph on the right. This is different for the mucus cells though. Um, again, this is our control scenario. And when we give cigarette smoke, we see that there's a large increase and a significant increase in the number of mucus cells um, just induced by cigarette smoke. This uh, induction is not seen by viral infection alone and that we did not see an increase in the number of mucus cells. And there was a trend towards an increase in the number of mucus cells with cigarette smoke and virus, but this was not statistically significant as shown here on the right. Now, when we look at the airway basal stem cells with marked, which by keratin-5, one of the stem cell markers, uh, we see that there's in, an increase um, and a significant increase in the number of these basal stem cells after cigarette smoke. Um, but after viral infection, we do not see an increase um, in the um, in, in, the, in, the, in the basal stem cells. And this was a little bit surprising to us because we thought that the cultures would register um, that there was a, an injury from the virus and respond uh, with, with um, basal stem cell response, but we did not see this. And um, in the setting of cigarette smoke with a virus, again, uh, we saw a trend um, towards an increase in the number of basal cells, um, but this did not end up being significant as shown uh, with the quantification on the right. Uh, another uh, surrogate for the basal stem cells is um, KI67 PCNA, which are markers of proliferating cells. And again, we saw that um, increase in proliferating cells after cigarette smoke injury, but not after viral injury. And this time um, we did see an increase in the number of proliferating cells um, in the setting of the infection and virus. And then when we looked at the number of apoptotic cells with immunostaining for cleaved caspase three, uh, we see very little um, in the control situation. We see a little bit after cigarette smoke um, and then uh, a little bit after viral infection alone, but we really saw a very nice increase uh, in the setting of cigarette smoke with virus, suggesting that the two together um, induce quite a bit of apoptosis within the cultures. So because we were seeing this very interesting effect of how cigarette smoke um, pre-SARS-CoV-2 pre, um, infection uh, caused an increase in the number of infected cells, uh, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what might be happening. And so we performed single cell RNA sequencing across these four different experimental groups. And the first thing that jumped out at us when we were doing the analysis um, is that we saw that in the viral infection groups, which is both with cigarette smoke and without cigarette smoke, we saw that there was a reduction just globally in the number of transcripts. And this is seen, I think, even more clearly in the heat map, um, where you can see here, we're looking at the SARS-CoV-2 um, down um, genes. And so in the setting of um, no cigarette smoke with virus or cigarette smoke and virus, we saw a similar decrease um, in, in all of these genes um, compared to um, the no cigarette or cigarette smoke alone without viral infection. Um, but there are a number of other interesting groups um, that came out of this analysis. And one group that we were really interested in uh, was a group um, where we saw an increase um, in um, an upregulation in gene expression in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 virus infection alone, um, but then a downregulation in the setting of cigarette smoke with SARS-CoV-2 because uh, we thought that this group might help us understand better about what cigarette smoke was doing. And so that's this group highlighted over here. And when we look a little bit um, deeper into it, uh, we see that there's a number of interferon response genes that are in this group. And so it's known, and there's now a, a fair body of literature, um, that an interferon response um, happens um, when there is SARS-CoV-2 infection and is important at mounting an immune response. But we also know that cigarette smoke uh, has been shown uh, to reduce the interferon response within cells. And so we think that at least one of the mechanisms whereby we're seeing this increased number of infected cells after cigarette smoke exposure is that the interferon response is being downregulated. And therefore, um, this is allowing the virus to enter the cells, um, probably enter more cells, and also set up um, uh, these, these larger clusters of infection. 
And so to, to examine this mechanistically, uh, we went ahead with these same four treatment groups and now looked at the effect of interferon beta um, response. And so here we added interferon beta to the cultures um, after the cigarette smoking, but before the viral infection. And what we found is that even in the setting of cigarette smoke with SARS-CoV-2, when we know that we see quite a, a lot of infected cells, we completely abrogated the infection. And this is in contrast to remdesivir, which was used as a control, where we see um, a great reduction in the number of infected cells with just a few infected patches, um, but the effect was even greater uh, with the addition of interferon beta. And this is highlighted um, and quantified here on the right where I'm showing you two different biological replicates and their response um, with um, interferon beta as compared to remdesivir. And so um, I'd just like to end by acknowledging um, my wonderful lab. Um, it's um, been really difficult um, with the pandemic and the restrictions um, on um, entering the lab and um, the, the need for social distancing and the reduction in hours that people have been able to work. Um, but they've really um, been amazing um, at um, performing these cultures and um, being able to, to, to generate these data. Um, in particular, um, I, I want to acknowledge Arunima Prakayastha, um, Chandani Sen, and Abdo Dara for all of their hard work. And also Tammy Rickabau, our lab manager, um, who's put a lot of time and effort into making sure that the lab continues to operate smoothly. I'd also like to acknowledge our funding support. And in particular, I'd like to thank the TRDRP, which was really the catalyst for us starting to think about this problem and really um, I, I, realizing that we could use um, what we'd done previously in the lab with cigarette smoke exposure of these ALI cultures um, to see how that affected SARS-CoV-2 infection. I also want to acknowledge Vaiti Aramagaswamy and Gas Garcia, uh, who are the amazing virologists who did all of the BSL-3 work, and Catherine Plath and Justin Langerman, who did all of our single cell RNA sequencing analysis. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.